And this morning we are going to be looking at Psalm 42. So if you have your Bible with you, wherever you are, wherever you are today, would you please open to Psalm 42? We chose this psalm because it addresses our present situation. There are some things that I really don't know about our present situation. For instance, I do not know when Ken and Sandy Nerlin are going to come home. Wish I did. And I'm certain that when they get home, they'll have some very interesting stories to tell. And I look forward to hearing them. But first, we need to find out when they're coming home and pray for them in the meantime. I also don't know how much actual damage is going to be done by this virus. And when we say actual damage, we mean to the health of people and also to the economy. We just don't know how much damage will be done. And we also don't know how to measure the good that is being done by the steps that people are taking. For instance, shelter in place. How do you measure things that don't happen? We are hoping that the steps prevent things from happening, but an actual number you can't attach to that. So there are many things that we don't know, but we do know this. We will be happy when it's behind us. We will be happy when it is over. For the second week in a row, our services have been disrupted. And even though we are finding this uplifting, we are ready for things to get back to normal. We are ready for our life to get back to normal. We are ready for our jobs to get back to normal. We are ready for our family situations to get back to normal. And we are ready for our services to God to get back to normal. Human beings are funny when we get to talking about routine. We look for ways to break up the monotony of our routine. But if our routine is taken from us and we have no choice in the matter, then all of a sudden our routine becomes a dear and precious thing and we want it back. It is true, you don't know what you've got till it's gone. Well, our routine is gone for the present, and we do want it back, and that brings us to Psalm 42. Uh, Psalm 42 is a picture of a man who is waiting, and he feels pretty much the same way that we do. In Psalm 42 and verse 1, as the deer pants for the water brooks, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night, while they say to me all day long, where is your God? These things I remember and I pour out my soul within me. For I used to go along with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with a voice of joy and thanksgiving, a multitude keeping festival. Now, when we think about the words that the psalmist is choosing, it lets us know that he is in a situation much like ours. We notice in verse 1 that the psalmist is thirsty, like the deer pants for the water brooks. This man is thirsty, but the psalmist's thirst doesn't have anything to do with literal water. The psalmist says he is thirsty for God. This is about his connection with God. Now, was this thirst? Thirst, his normal state? Or was there some circumstance that was creating this condition? If you'll notice verse 2, My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? You'll notice he is thirsty because he wants to come and appear before God. 
Now, under the old law, the law under which the psalmist lived, the place you went to if you wanted to appear before God was the temple in Jerusalem. There were sacrifices that you offered. There were services that you rendered. And sometimes when we think about this service, we tend to think that it was pretty cold and ritualistic. But I'd like you to notice the fourth verse again. These things I remember, and I pour out my soul within me. For I used to go along with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with a voice of joy and thanksgiving, a multitude-keeping festival. This is about joy and thanksgiving and a multitude of people keeping festival. And the psalmist loved it, but his routine is disrupted. In the fourth verse, he says, I used to go. It had been taken away from him. There was an assembly that he had once been a part of, and now he is missing it. So now he is thirsty. He misses what once was, and he wants it back. Well, what, what had disrupted his service? What is it that had cut him off from the thing that he desired so much? The text doesn't really specify it, but it obviously has something to do with an enemy. In verse 9, I will say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? There is an enemy that keeps him from appearing before his God. In the third verse, the enemy is mocking him. The enemy is saying, where is your God? So this is the condition that he is in. And here's what we have up to this point. We have a man who is in the habit of serving God, coming to appear before God, but an enemy is in his way, presents, uh, prevents it from happening. And so now he really misses what he had. And he wants it back. He wants to get back into the routine he used to have. Now, brethren, how is he going to deal with it? What will the psalmist do in this situation? Beginning in verse 5. Why are you in despair, O my soul? And why have you become disturbed within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him for the help of his presence. O oh my God, my soul is in despair within me. Therefore I remember you from the land of the Jordan and the peaks of Hermon from Mount Mizar. Deep calls to deep at the sound of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have rolled over me. The Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime, and his song will be with me in the night, a prayer to the God of my life. How will we deal with a situation like this? What is the psalmist going to do since he is cut off from coming before God? You'll notice first in verse 5, he says, Why are you in despair, O my soul? That's not really a question. That's a statement. What he is really saying is that I will not give in to despair. I will not let it crush me. I will not let it overcome me. Now, he's not going to minimize his problem. He's not going to pretend that there is no problem or that the problem does not exist. When you read the psalm and the description of what is taking place, uh, this very well could be descriptive of some of the things that happened to King David. Uh, for instance, when David was running away from Saul, these ideas would be appropriate. When he was running away from Absalom, these ideas that are being presented would be appropriate. And there are other situations in David's life. <coughs> and there are situations in the other heroes in the Old Testament that we read about. So... It's not like it's nothing, but even in a time where he feels some despair, he says, I'm simply not going to let myself give in to despair, but rather in verse 5, I will hope in God, and I shall again praise thee. I shall again. 
this situation is not going to be permanent. It's only going to be temporary. Who's going to make it better? God is. God is the one that is going to help. In verses 6 and 7, O oh my God, my soul is in despair within me. Therefore I remember you from the land of the Jordan and the peaks of Hermon from Mount Mizar. Uh, I will remember. Remember what? All this about the Jordan and Mount Mizar, God's waterfalls, God's waves. What's the point? Well, the point is it's still God's world. He is the one who is in control. I'm going to remember something about God. I'm going to remember that it's your waves, your waterfalls, your world. Why hope in God? Because it is still his world. And since it's still God's world, I'll put my hope in God. I will not give in to despair. And my days and my nights have already been planned out for me. In verse 8, the Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime and his song will be with me in the night, a prayer to the God of my life. I don't like the situation I'm in. I'd like to come and appear before God, but at the moment it just can't be. How am I going to deal with it? I'm not going to give in to despair. I'll hope in God. I'll remember it's God's world and my days and my nights are planned out. What are they? Number one, the Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime and his song will be with me in the night, a prayer to the God of my life. What am I going to do with my days? In my days, I'm going to experience the loving kindness of God. He will continue to be good to me no matter what is going on around me. That is what he does. How will I spend my nights? My nights are going to be a song and a prayer. That's what they will be. The psalmist is cut off from where he would want to be. He says, when will I appear before God? There are things that he cannot do, but there are things that he can do. In the day, he will experience God's loving kindness. And at night, he will offer God a song and a prayer. What a great plan that is. That's how you deal with a situation where you're cut off from something that you love and now are missing. Now, that was the psalmist. Can we see ourselves in this? I mean, are we not in the same situation at the moment? What is our current situation? We are thirsty, not for literal water. We are thirsty for God. It is about our connection with God like a deer pants for the water brooks. What we are wanting to do is to come and appear before him. Now understand that today we don't have to go to Jerusalem and find the temple. It doesn't work that way. But as Christians, we still come together on the first day of the week. At this congregation, we come together twice on the Lord's day. We come together on Wednesday night. We have classes at other times. We have assemblies that involve more than 10 people. And boy, you don't know what you got till it's gone, do you? It's only been two weeks. But these things I remember and I pour out my soul within me. For I used to go along with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with a voice of joy and thanksgiving, a multitude-keeping festival. The psalmist had his experience with Old Testament worship. We have ours in Christ. But you notice that the language fits. If we talk about what we experience here on a weekly basis when we come together with our brethren, it is joy and thankfulness. It is a festival. It is a group of people keeping festival to God. Now, sometimes maybe we don't think of it that way. 
But sometimes when it is taken away from us and we read passages like this, we realize that this is no burden. This is something that is a part of our life. And now all of a sudden it's routine disrupted. It's something we used to do, a place we used to go. Only two weeks. Ready for it to be over. What foe has done this to us? I will say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? Who is the enemy that has put us in this position? A virus? That sounds funny. A virus. We're like the psalmist. Thirsty for God. We want to come and appear before him. Our routine has been disrupted. We want it back. So how are we going to deal with it? Brethren, we're going to deal with it the same way that the psalmist dealt with it. Number one, we are not going to give in to despair. The situation we are in may be a little bit abnormal and unusual, and we don't have to like everything about it, and we're not going to minimize the fact that it does create some problems. But what we are experiencing really, less than the psalmist, we're quite certain that whatever it was he was experiencing when he had an enemy mocking him and keeping him from being where he wanted to be, uh, what, we had, what he had was much more than inconvenient. What we experience today, it's not going to crush us. We are not going to despair. It will be a test of patience. Whenever you don't know what's in front of you, that tends to try your patience it will be a test of patience and it will be a test of our faithfulness can we endure something like this well yeah we can we will hope in God and we understand that I shall again praise him this situation is going to pass we're going to come back together as a group of God's people now, somebody says, well, it's already been two weeks. How many weeks is it going to be? Don't know. But if Noah can spend a year inside the ark. And if the children of Judah can spend 70 years in Babylon. And if Jesus can fast for 40 days and 40 nights. I think we can handle this. It's something that we are going to be able to do. Uh, we can deal with this and we can have confidence until it should pass away. And we will remember something. This is still God's world. Therefore, I remember you from the land of the Jordan and the peaks of Hermon from Mount Mizar. Deep calls to deep at the sound of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have rolled over me. It's God's world. Now, you might think events are spiraling out of control. The problem is growing and growing and growing, and it's nothing but chaos, and it's nothing but confusion. They're canceling school, and the kids are all going to get scared. I suspect the kids are going to do fine. Uh, they're going to enjoy it for a little while, and then they'll get bored with that. But if we think that things are just spiraling, they're spiraling, but they are not out of control. Men in this world are really doing a pretty fair job of dealing with this situation. I've never seen, you know, this society, I've never seen people work together in this manner. In my generation, they seem to be working hard, doing what they can to try to alleviate any problem that, that should arise due to the virus. So we're kind of happy about that. Won't be able to measure the good that's done, but we're happy for the effort. But what we truly remember is that this continues to be God's world. And he has the power to turn 
all of this to his purpose. We won't give in to despair. We will hope in God. We will remember it is still God's world. And because of that, our days and our nights are all planned out for us. What will we do with our days while we are trying to get through this virus? No school and everything is closed down. No Starbucks, no restaurants, no movies. Most of all, no coming together with the saints as we usually do. How will we get through that? What will we do with our days? Brethren, what we're going to do is we're going to experience the loving kindness of God. He will be good to us. He will strengthen us. And he will get us through this. If my wife should say, what was your day like today, Scott? Good answer. Today I have experienced the loving kindness of God. Because we have. A passage that Scott read in the very beginning of the service. Uh, we, I mean, this is an often quoted passage and... and since we read it often, let's remember it at the appropriate time, which is now. Uh, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. Now we're not being slaughtered at the moment. But if it was happening, we could overcome that. For I'm convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. We're okay. That's it. We're okay. What are we going to do with our days? In our days, we are going to experience the loving kindness of God. But what are we going to do with our nights? Song and a prayer. The Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime, and his song will be with me in the night, a prayer to the God of my life. Sometimes we say the mercy and grace of God are free. Well, they're not. They're going to cost you. It's going to cost you a song and a prayer. I guess actually that's pretty much free, isn't it? Our nights will be a song and a prayer. So my soul thirst for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? Like the psalmist, we are cut off from our normal routine of worship. Can't wait for it to be over. But brethren, we're going to handle it like the psalmist. We're not going to despair. We will continue to hope in God, remembering it is still his world. And we got a plan for how we're going to spend our time. We experience the loving kindness of God during the day, a song and a prayer by night. Now, at this point, we usually give the invitation. We say, if you are not a Christian, you need to believe in Jesus and turn from your sins and confess your faith in Christ and be baptized for the remission of your sins. The like fig figure wherein even baptism doth also now save us. And we say, come forward. Well, this is a little bit different situation. Not many people here to come forward. But you know what? If there is somebody who is thinking about their relationship to God and the gospel of Jesus Christ, and they know they have the need to become a Christian, we suggest that they contact us and contact us today. 
until later. Open God and follow the plan. That is a good plan. Don't give in to despair. Hope in God. Remember it's God's world. And that's what your day and your night's all about. Thank you.